congratulations on a really um, wonderful take on Stravinsky. Thank you. I appreciated uh, seeing that it's a sort of a, a work in progress. Um, and I was curious, um, how does that process work? I mean, uh, listening, studying, feel, is it is a little bit of everything? It's a little bit of everything. What I really wanted to do is just honestly wanted to play the Rite of Spring on the piano. I had actually already learned uh, the, the short version of Petrushka that Stravinsky himself had arranged, but Rite of Spring, there isn't really a performance version that's typically played. It has been arranged a couple of times for solo piano. Stravinsky himself arranged it for piano duet. There are all these kind of quasi versions, but I really wanted it to be for me. You know, I wanted it to be in a way that fit my technique. Um, I looked at one of the versions and I thought it was um, a little overly simplistic and I looked at another version and it has too many details in it and it, for me at least it was unplayable, you know, so I wanted to do something that really worked for me, but it just came from my loving the Rite of Spring so much and when I heard, I heard it as a student, I think I was about 18 or 19 when I heard it for the first time and I just hadn't heard anything like it. I mean, I, in, in at least in classical music, I mean, I, at that time I was listening to a lot of Genesis and Frank Zappa and I mean, I, I was very much into rhythm and so when I heard the Rite of Spring I thought, oh, well, this, this, I can't believe this is a piece of classical music. I mean, it's, it, I just had no idea that, that music had gone in that direction. I was just too young to know. So I immediately started trying to play bits of it by ear. And then I found the duet version. And, and I read through the duet version of the Rite of Spring with a friend of mine. And we were playing through and I said, you know, this is really weird, but there's this really cool bassoon line that's missing. And I think if we do this with our hands, you know, we'll be able to fit it in. And, and then we'd play another couple pages and I'd say, you know, there's another thing missing here. There's a, there's a bass drum thing and, and wouldn't it be nice if we could do this? And, and I was just all over trying to get these details <laughs> in there. And, and uh, finally, one of my colleagues says, you know, you should try to just do this yourself. <laughs> so, so that's really how it, it, it came about. And, and at the time that I recorded it, it really wasn't anymore a work in progress. But it is true that every time I perform it, I tweak something. You know, I still make little minor tweaks every time. Because what happens is I'll, I'll go to a live performance of the Rite of Spring or I'll hear another recording that I don't know. And a certain voice will come through in a certain way and I'll think, oh, you know, I think maybe I can make that happen too. You know, and there are just one of the techniques that pianists use is called voicing. And it's basically the technique where you're, you, you might play several notes at once, but one or two of those notes are going to sound a little louder than, than some of the others on purpose, and you want different lines to be evident. You want to create um, a series of horizontal events while you're actually playing a lot of vertical events. And that's really key if you're playing a transcription of an orchestral piece, is to really work with voicing. And I'm always finding a way that I can bring in another voice, make something happen that just makes it more interesting. Yeah, I think uh, I was um, amazed at those voices coming out, uh, and there's such incredible articulation in general, uh, but that I actually heard new things, and I think I, I love this piece, maybe almost as much as you do. I, do, I haven't looked at a solo violin version yet, I can't imagine, <laughs> but uh, that I, I was like, I think I've learned something from this, and it was so wonderful to hear it. It, it almost... Uh, when I hear the two piano version and when I hear your version, to me it almost brings out the, the even more modern sound of the score. Right. I mean, in a certain sense, playing it solo gives you the freedom to, especially in performance uh, and in a recording session, I felt like I had the freedom to really just do whatever I wanted, you know, go in whatever direction I wanted with it and not feel so conscious of ensemble with the other player or anything, you know. And what a conductor has to deal with in the Rite of Spring is an extreme amount of responsibility to just simple rhythmic clarity for the orchestra because it's very complex and it's a terrifying piece for the violin section to play. There's, there's a section uh, in, in the last movement where there's this ba-da, 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 ba-da. But, uh, and it completely sort of seems at random, you know, where the rests are, and, and violinists are terrified that they're <laughs> going to play in a rest, you know. So there's all this sort of responsibility for ensemble. And what I find in a solo piano version is that I can actually just go for it. And the piano, of course, is uniquely suited to anything where you've got a percussive rhythmic effect. And in those parts of the piece, the solo piano in some ways is, um, honestly, I think more 
able to communicate what Stravinsky was going for than a full orchestra. Now, of course, with a full orchestra, you get this incredible panoply of color. I mean, it is an unbelievable amount of, of orchestral color. And, and to play it at the piano, my, part of my job is to try to duplicate some of that color with this idea of voicing different textures happening at different times, different articulations happening at different times, all of that. Yeah, and I think uh, whether it's our ears, since we uh, know this piece, that sometimes we'll fit in that timpani lick that's that great boom, deep dong you know, sort of the birth of rock and roll, I always call that section, mm -hmm. you know, the really funky stuff, or that, uh, the, again, your articulations and voicing change to give us that sort of, uh, those those elders that are dancing, that slow shit, boom, boom, you know, right, all those, right. those great basses. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's got to be a great, uh, all this has to be a, a juggling act to remember, oh, this is what's going on, or, you know, you're orchestrating with your touch. Yeah, it is a juggling act. That's actually a very good term for it, because uh, the... The technique that was pioneered, or at least uh, made very popular, by Franz Liszt, uh, it's called the three-handed technique, and it's and it's where you're you're at the piano, and you need to have an accompaniment in the left hand, and you also need to have an accompaniment in the right hand, some other kind of texture happening, and the melody is happening somewhere in the middle, and whichever hand happens to have a free thumb will play that melody, and so to be in control of that melody with opposing thumbs while you're playing this shimmering accompaniments is a very complicated uh, feet, technical feet, but it sounds to a listener like there are three hands, you know, one, two, three, very, very, very simple. And what happened in transcribing Rite of Spring was occasionally I felt like I actually needed four. <laughs> and, and, and it's it's like that trick where you, where, where you see a, a, a juggler with, with something on each hand and on each foot and then they put it on their, you know, on their forehead or something. And so you have to give a little bit of attention to everything at just the right time to keep it going. <laughs> Well, I know we're all excited because it's the 100th anniversary of uh, uh, The Rite of Spring, so it's fabulous for it to come out now. Um, but I, I would uh, ask, was it, uh, th they're both ballets. I think there's something, uh, I, was, I, I tell friends there's Italian leather, there are Cuban cigars, and there's Russian ballet. <laughs> You know that there, it's sort of the best of the that's, best. That's right. And so I was it also a sort of a love of Petrushka and having played that smaller version exactly. to tackle it. Yeah. Well, I played the smaller version of Petrushka, and, well, as a student, and I and I loved it. And that's one that Stravinsky really did write for performance. And he thought, well, I'll make a condensed version, and instead of the tragic ending of Petrushka, I'll give it kind of a brilliant concert ending. And you know, I mean, he did all of this to facilitate performing at least part of Petrushka at the piano. And, and I love that version, and I have played it, but when I started relearning it, I thought, you know, I would actually, to get a more orchestral effect, maybe less pianistic effect, but a more orchestral effect, I would actually double the notes in the left hand instead of in the right, and I would do something different here, and I started playing with it, and then there's, there's this uh, drum effect that separates the acts, and I thought it would be really great to play that somehow. Uh, and then my daughter mentioned that you know she noticed that the bear dance was missing and that maybe it'd be good to put that back in. And before you knew it, I thought, well, I'm going to play the whole opening of Shore Tide Fair because that's so colorful. I mean, the the, the fair with you know it's 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 very cinematic. You know, you feel like there's a camera swooping in to a, to a fair and it looks this way and you see one kind of dancing and it looks another way and you see another kind of dancing. There's all this going on. And, and then this weird magician appears with these three puppets, and then the whole thing takes on a slightly mysterious tone, you know. And, and then, of course, Petrushka, for all its uh, uh, colorful energy, is, of the two ballets, is the real tragedy and, and the way it ends. And so I did finally transcribe the complete original ballet with the death of Petrushka at the end, because I thought that really is how the whole story is told. You know, that's the whole story. And it's again, was an incredible experience to do that. Just to try to find the color, to try to find the energy, and to try to really see the dancers. Yeah. Uh, have you conducted either of these uh, works? I haven't Forks conducted Jeff? anything <laughs> remotely as complicated as this. My, my conducting experience is, is one thing and one thing only, which is if I'm playing a Mozart piano concerto from the keyboard, I can get it started. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Well, I think you could probably, with these two now, uh, knowing them inside and out, it'd be pretty fun to if, get, at least get the Rice guys here together, yeah. you know, and say, hey. If, if you I know. had the technique, at least I, I know how it goes. <laughs> I just don't have that technique. <laughs> All right. Well, that's fair. Does this uh, affect other 
um, pieces of Stravinsky that you might I uh, know there's a concerto for wind and winds and, and piano and stuff does this make you want to go back or look at the octet and say oh you know that might be kind of a cool piano <laughs> interestingly I have never really liked any of Stravinsky's piano music and I'm still not crazy about a lot of it I I hear those ballets and I hear honesty I hear Stravinsky as a young honest composer with instinct uh, obviously musical education, but it's more about instinct and more about what he felt that he just had to write. And later Stravinsky doesn't resonate with me, at least the, 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 the same way. Uh, what has been an incredible experience for me, having worked on uh, The Rite of Spring and worked on Petrushka and really been so inspired by the uh, original orchestration, it's inspired me to now take a look at other piano music that has orchestral equivalents and bring more to it. And the very first thing that happened was I went straight to Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition. First of all, again, it's you know we're in, we're in the world of Russian music, but there's a piece that's originally written for the piano, much more famous as an orchestra piece in, in, in the Ravel orchestration. And now I feel that I have a bigger palette of color in my playing that I could play pictures at an exhibition and make a lot more out of it than I would have five years ago. And so that's that for me that's exciting because all of us, all of us who are in the arts, uh, musicians, pianists, conductors, violinists, singers, it's a constant process of growth. You know, we're always trying to find something new for for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Is it uh, something you want to share with uh, others and have these editions out? Well, I'd like very much for other pianists to be able to play it. Uh, the first step, uh, other than getting permission, the first step would be actually writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> and I've written some of it down. Uh, I, I work from a really, uh, I think in England they call it a dog's breakfast, you know, like this really complicated score, which is bits of other published scores, uh, bits of things I've printed up in a computer software called Finale, uh, uh, bits and pieces taken from the duet score. Uh, sometimes I'll just write it in by hand, and then a lot of the times it's in my head and I just never got to writing it down. So uh, one of the reasons that making the CD has been very helpful for me personally is it's my document as a reminder of what I do. So if, <laughs> if I come back to it 10 years from now, I'll be able to figure out what it is that I did now. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I love, I, I think that uh, feel comes out that there's, whether or not it's a, a tempo change or whether or not it's, um, you know, a sudden these big 11, 11 four bar, right, you know, right, that comes yeah. through that, you know, just has this certain power. I think it comes across incredibly well. So I think we're all very happy that you've gone through and, and done this. Thank you, John. I guess I'd, I'd end asking What's next? Maybe the Mazorski? What, what do you what, have? Any recordings on the horizon that you want to? I do actually. I have. I'm uh, s uh, within the next year or so. We'll release a recording called Fantasy, which will include not only a few of the standard fantasies like the Schumann Fantasy and the Schubert Wanderer Fantasy, but also uh, the fantasy on themes from Harold Arlen's The Wizard of Oz. Uh, uh, as arranged uh, brilliantly for solo piano by the American uh, composer William Hertz. And so that's really exciting because that music I've played in recital and, and, and of course you recognize that music, but then what, he, what uh, Hertz has done with uh, weaving it together and giving it some slightly different harmonic uh, flavor is absolutely spectacular. Uh, I'm also uh, will be recording the Mussorgsky pictures at an exhibition. Uh, probably pairing that actually with Schumann Carnival as a kind of a whole album of pictures, you know, pictures and characters. Yeah. I mean, it's characters, you know, and to me that's such an interesting part of, of being a pianist is bringing all these uh, people, personalities, ideas, and, and pictures to life. And say people thought multimedia was a 21st century thing. Right. Mussorgsky and Schumann, <laughs> those guys were already David Bundler's tons, all well, those, that's all, you know, that's all, you know. Very well, nice. Jackie, it's nice to talk thank with you and uh, look forward to much more. Thank you. Thanks very much, John.